Praise the Lord. Church, praise the Lord. For your double portion, for your second portion, I said praise the Lord. Happy to be back with you again. I said I'm happy to be with you again. And who knows, I might give you an extra time again. That will be wonderful. Well, thank the Lord for being here for our Bible study. And we appreciate all who are here for the first time. And I pray that this will not be your last time in Deeper Life Bible study in Jesus' name. Amen. You have heard about the retreat. The retreat of this year is going to be special. Amen. Special for you. Amen. But if you are not there, you will not know his specialty. You will be there. Amen. I will be there. Amen. The final solution to every problem of your life is Jesus. And as you come to the retreat, it's going to be a wonderful time. And for our Tuesday leaders tomorrow, because we are preparing for the retreat, I'm going to give a special message and I'm going to top up everything we've got because this year, for every leader, for every minister, for every worker, for every member, and for all our people, it's going to be a special year. Your leaders are going to be turned around. Power in their lives. Authority in their lives. A new anointing in every life of the leader in Jesus' name. And our district churches and group churches and region and state and national churches will never be the same again. Even me, myself, the pastor, I will never be the same again. I will serve you more. I will serve you better. And every need in your life will be fulfilled and answered by the Lord in Jesus' name. Let's close our eyes for prayer for tonight's Bible study. Father, we thank you for our Bible study tonight. I will glorify your name because you brought us together. I'm praying, Lord, you'll bless your faithful people in Jesus' name. And I pray, Lord, everything we study today will move us forward in the direction we ought to go. And Lord, we will be blessed today, blessed this year, blessed for the rest of our lives, and all through eternity we'll carry your blessings on. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God said... God bless you. Consider we're coming to a Bible study tonight from Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 42. Mark chapter 9, we're looking at verse 42. And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better that a millstone were hanged upon his neck and he was cast into the sea verse 43 and if thy hand offend thee cut it off for it is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to be cast to go into hell that is into the fire that never shall be quenched where the worm dies not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, that is, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Where the worm dies not, and the fire is not quenched. If thy eye offend thee, pluck it out. 
but it is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire where the worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. Verse 49 For every one shall be salted with fire and every sacrifice shall be salted or salt. Salt is good. But if salt has lost its saltness, wherewith will ye season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace one with another. It's so very interesting that those are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the words of the Lord Jesus Christ are valuable. The words of the Lord Jesus Christ are weighty. The words of the Lord Jesus Christ have eternal unending effect. The words of the Lord Jesus Christ abide and remain even though heaven and earth, the sky and the seas and the ocean, everything may pass away. Yet the words of the Lord Jesus Christ are eternal. That's what he said is the final word. Is the faithful word, is the great word the heavenly has, Father has for us, and He has given us that final word, the full word, the full gospel, the full revelation in the Lord Jesus Christ. As you look at the verses I've read today, and you see what Jesus Christ was saying, you will understand that no other preacher, no other pastor, no other shepherd, no other preacher revealed about the subject he was talking about like he did. And that means that he had the first hand knowledge because he's God, because he's the Son of God, because he has been from all eternity and he has come to us here on earth. Number one, to reverse the curse. Number two, to take the fall of man and take it away from us and we have redemption. And then to save us from eternal damnation, eternal doom, eternal destruction. He has come specially to reveal his mind unto us. And because this is peculiar to him, because no other person gives such a revelation like this, that's why you and I need to pay attention. And everyone ought to pay attention to what Christ has got to say because it is true, because it is valid, and because it will never change, because he himself the same yesterday, today, and forever. That means that even his word, his utterance, his revelation, everything he has given us abides and remains forever and will not change. There are preachers who will gloss over this passage of scripture we have read because they cannot imagine, because they cannot understand, and because they do not understand, that's why they will say maybe it's figurative. Maybe it is not real. Maybe it is not the real thing. But Jesus Christ spoke about it. And he spoke about it directly. And he spoke about it firmly. And he revealed that this is the truth that cannot be changed. This word of God we're reading today. The word of God we're learning today. Like any other word we have learned will abide forever. The truthfulness of it will abide forever. And the faithfulness of it will abide forever. The words of Christ cannot change. And the revelation he has given cannot change, will not change. That's why only the wise people will pay attention. The wise people will understand. The wise people will know that this is the word of God. It will be fulfilled. Look at Matthew chapter 24. I'm reading from verse 35. Matthew chapter 24, and I'm reading from verse 35. It says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Heaven and earth, the sky, the ocean, the sea, even the earth, the globe that we see now, everything will pass away. But the word of God, 
the revelation of God abides and remains and will not pass away. That's the reason why we need to understand. That's the reason why we need to pay attention and hear the words of Christ. Because even those who do not believe the words of Christ, it's going to be fulfilled on them too. Look at Matthew chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 5. Matthew chapter 17. We're reading from verse 5. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, the voice out of the cloud, which says, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. That's the Heavenly Father. That's the Almighty God. That's the Creator of the heavens and their saying, Look at Christ. Look at the Savior. Look at Jesus Christ. He is my son, my only begotten son, and my beloved son. I'm well pleased in him. Hear ye him. Does he talk about heaven? Hear ye him. Does he talk about hell? Hear ye him. Does he talk about blessing? Hear ye him. Does he talk about redemption? And he talks about how we can escape the judgment of God. Hear ye him. Does he reveal a new truth that was not well cleared up in the Old Testament and is bringing it fresh to you from the throne of God? Hear ye him. We need to hear him. And we need to be taught by him. And as you hear him, and you are taught by him, and you accept his word, blessing will be upon your life. I said blessing will be upon your life. You know, there are people, I, you know, somebody told me some years ago, he said, you know what? I come whenever you are going to talk about faith. When you are going to talk about healing, about the promises of God, I come. But I want to tell you, when you are going to talk about, you know, holiness, and you are going to talk about uh, the future, and you are going to talk about heaven or hell, uh, you know, I never come. I, I guess that this is what you are going to talk about, and I don't come. And I said, you're a loser for that. Every word of Jesus is important. Whatever you read of Christ, whatever you know of Christ, anything he's saying, he's talking about heaven, hear ye him. He's talking about hell, hear ye him. He's talking about blessings today, and he's talking about the judgment to come, hear ye him. Acts of the Apostles, I'm reading from chapter 3. Acts of the Apostles, I'm reading from chapter 3. It says in chapter 3, uh, talking about uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, verse 22, it says, For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you from your brethren like unto me, and him ye shall hear in all things. Him ye shall hear in all things. It talks about the earth. Him ye shall hear in all things. It talks about the future beyond the grave and beyond death. Him ye shall hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. That's why we learn the Bible in our church and we go from chapter to chapter, from verse to verse and we don't meet anything and say, ah, ah, that one is not good, that one is not palatable, that one is not interesting, that one is not sweet and so we're not going to listen to that. The Lord has said, the word of God has said, him ye shall hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. Look at verse 23. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet, referring to the Christ who was to come, shall be destroyed from among the people. I pray you will not be destroyed. I pray I will not be destroyed. I teach, you hear, you say each, I hear, and every one of us will go into the word of God and will understand what God is saying and we obey and we believe and we follow the direction is leading us and because of that, we will not perish. Because of that, I will not perish. You will not perish in Jesus' name. Today we're looking at the subject Christ's irrefutable revelation on man's future. 
is about the future is talking about. It's talking about where sinners will spend eternity. It's talking about where unrepented, unrepentant, uh, or impenitent uh, backsliders will spend eternity. It's talking about man's future. And it's a great revelation. It's a kind of revelation uh, that many people do not understand and many people are not talking about, but it is indisputable. It is undebatable and it is irrefutable and it is coming from Christ. Christ's irrefutable revelation on man's future. There are three things we're looking at as we consider the passage today. Number one, the deceptive stumbling blocks of tempters' offense. The offense coming from tempters because those tempters are thoughtless. They do not understand the consequence of their temptation. They do not understand the judgment on their temptation. And therefore they put stumbling blocks before the pilgrims who are going to heaven. And the deceptive, the deceptive stumbling blocks of tempters of pain. Number two, our definite separation from tempting objects. If there are objects that tempt us, if there are objects that detract us, if there are objects that will make us fall, if there are objects that will make us sin, if there are objects that will turn us away from the direction of heaven and turn us the way of hell, we have the responsibility and we have the duty that we cut off from everyone, from anything, from any object that will hinder us from getting to heaven. You will not permit, you will not allow anything to hinder your heaven in Jesus' name. God has uh, prepared a place for you. And Christ has gone to prepare a place for you. And anything or anyone that will say, follow me to hell, you will say, no, you will not follow anybody to hell. I will not follow anybody to hell. The definite, our definite separation from tempting objects. Point number three, they are decreed suffering. A decree. If you remember when the military was in power, they didn't, you know, give suggestions, they didn't give ideas, they didn't plead with us in the nation. Hey, would you mind to do this? Would you mind to go here? You not mind to go there? They made a decree. And once the decree has come out, nothing you know, will change it. It was a rigid situation. And the same thing, you know, the suffering of sinners, eternal suffering of sinners, is decreed by God. And Christ has spoken about that. Their decreed suffering with eternal torment. I pray the Lord will be with every one of us. His grace will abide in our lives. His grace will multiply in our lives. That a decreed suffering, I will not be part of that. I said you will not be part of that. The Lord will grant us His grace. The Lord will multiply His grace upon our lives. And His grace will make us escape all the doom, all the danger, all the damnation, all the devastation of the people that walk in the broad way in Jesus' name. I was expecting a good, good amen. Amen. We're coming to point number one now, the deceptive stumbling blocks of tempters' offense. We're coming to Mark chapter 9, and I'm reading from verse 42. Mark chapter 9, verse 42. And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it, it is better for him that he meals to own one hand about his neck, and he were cast into the sea. What was Jesus saying there? He said, 
these ones that believe in me. Some people have read that to mean uh, little children, little infants, toddlers, whosoever will offend these little ones. It's not talking about toddlers, really. It's not talking about infants, really. It's talking about new converts. It's talking about babes in Christ. It's talking about the little ones that have little knowledge, little understanding. You can easily sway them. You can deceive them. You can cajole them. You can tantalize them, whatever. They believe in the Lord, but they're young. They believe in the Lord, but they're babes in Christ. They believe in the Lord, but they're not experienced. They believe in the Lord, but they're still tender. And then somebody comes, whosoever, whosoever, may be a great man, may be a small man, whosoever. You know, somebody that you trust, that you think, he lead me right. He cannot deceive me. I'm a new convert. I'm a baby in Christ. And what do I know? And this person then comes to deceive him and to distract him and to destroy him and to defile him and to lead him in the way of unrighteousness. It says, whosoever, whatever the intention of the person, whatever the purpose of the person, whatever the excuse of the person, whosoever shall offend one of these new converts who believe in me, it were better for that man, for that whosoever, that a millstone were hanged upon his neck and he were cast into the sea. What's he talking about? Whosoever shall offend. That is, whosoever was mislead somebody who has believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and mislead him into error mislead him into false doctrine, mislead him into sinful character, mislead him into defilement. Whosoever will do that and say that new convert doesn't understand, the new convert doesn't know, the new convert will not be able to tell left from right, whatever I tell him, whatever I tell her, that's what he's going to believe, that's what she's going to believe, and because of that, that whosoever a man, that whosoever a woman, that whosoever a worker, that whosoever a preacher, that whosoever a respected leader, whosoever will offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it were better a millstone, a heavy stone, were hanged upon his neck, and he'll be drowned in the sea. Look at Proverbs chapter 28. Proverbs chapter 28, and we're reading from verse 10. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 10. Whoso casteth the right, whoso causes the righteous to go astray in an evil way. That's what he's talking about. This person is saved, this person is born again, and there is a whosoever. It takes joy in misleading people. It takes joy in deceiving people. It takes joy in eradicating or erasing the trace of holiness from the life of the people who are saved and sanctified. It takes joy in making people forget about Christ and forget about heaven and forget about holiness. And it does it effectively. It, it tells them, it shows them, it deceives them them, he cajoles them, and those people believe a lie, whosoever causes the righteous to go astray in an evil way, he shall fall himself into his own pit, but the upright shall have good things in possession. You will not deceive anybody. I will not deceive anybody. Uh, you know, there are preachers that deceive their congregations. You know why? They want their congregation to enlarge. And they want their congregation uh, to be very big. And they just want people 
they don't want to tell them the truth. If I tell them that, if I show them that, I'll not be popular. And because of that, they lie to their congregation. And they make the sinners to feel satisfied in their sin, backsliders to feel satisfied in their backsliding. And the believing people of God not to move forward, what you've got is enough, or will say you are not all right. Those preachers deceive their members because they want to take advantage of them. They say, you know, you want to go to a deeper life. Okay, you can go, but you know, when you go there, you will hear the rural message. Here, we love you. Here, we pet you. That's not love. You see somebody going the way of hell to hell and you are not telling them the truth. That's not love. That's wickedness. I pray that none of our pastors or preachers or leaders or workers will be wicked to the sheep in the fold in Jesus' name. Look at Ezekiel chapter 13. Ezekiel chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 22. Ezekiel 13 verse 22. It says, Because what lies, ye have made the heart of the righteous sad. With lies, ye have made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad, and strengthened the hand of the wicked that he should not return from his wicked way by promising him life. And the Lord says, you make the righteous sad. You tell them, why are you so serious about holiness, about sanctification, about purity of heart? Why are you punishing yourself? Everybody will go to heaven. God is a good God. How can God look at you like this? And you have been coming to church. Even though you are still in your sin, He will pity you. They make the sinners remain in their sins. And they make the righteous sad. And the Lord said, He will punish them. I pray you will not be like that. You know, if you are like that, and you discourage people from being holy, discourage people from being righteous and people think of you as a man of authority a woman of authority and because of the stature you have in the church eh, they believe you but you're misleading them whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in my name it were better for him not to be born. It were better for him that a millstone will be hanged upon his neck and uh, he will be drowned. Look at verse 23. Therefore, he shall see no more vanity, nor divine divinations. For I will deliver my people out of your hand, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. The Lord will deliver us from their hands in Jesus' name. Look at Malachi. Malachi chapter 2. In Malachi chapter 2, we're reading from verse 8. It's still talking about these preachers and these prophets and these teachers and these people who are trying to enlighten other people, but they themselves are not well enlightened. Malachi chapter 2. I were reading from verse 8. But he had departed out of the way. Those are the people who are trying to teach others, trying to lead others, trying to instruct others. And they're making those people offend God because they're not abiding by the truth. But she had departed out of the way. Ye have caused many people to stumble at the Lord. You see, there are people that when members come to the church and members say, uh, you know, they get saved and they are moving forward to get sanctified and remain holy, they will go to them and teach them things to do and things to say that will make them stumble at the word of God. There are people that as we come to the Bible study, they will distract those who are the Bible study they might do that before the meeting. They might do that during the meeting. And they make them not to concentrate on the word that will take them to heaven. It says, ye are departed out of the way. And ye have caused many to stumble at the Lord. Ye have corrupted the covenant of Levi. 
says the Lord of hosts. And can they do that, mislead other people and go scot-free? Can they do that and make other people disobedient, rebellious, and offensive and go scot-free? Look at verse 9. Therefore, have I also made you contemptible and base before all the people according as ye have not kept my ways. Look at this, look at this. But have been partial in the law. Partial in the law. They will speak strong on some areas of the word of God. And then they speak low and weak on other areas of the world. And when they speak low, and they, when they weaken other people, it's the most important thing. It's the essential thing. The essential thing that will take people to heaven, they don't make people concentrate on that, but the uh, periphery, the superficial, the things that are not important, that's what they major on. And they make people serious on that very devoted to that but when it comes to holiness without which no man shall see the lord that's when they discourage people i pray you'll not be like that if you have been like that repentance will come in jesus name conviction will come in jesus name because you understand god is no respecter of persons if you will discourage people and if you will make people compromise, if you make them offensive unto God, the judgment will come upon you, whosoever you are. Let's come to Romans chapter 14. And I'm reading from verse 13. Romans chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 13. It says, let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in, to fall in his brother's way. It says that you should judge yourself, examine yourself, and make sure that you are not in the habit you are not putting forth any action that will make your brother to fall. You will not make other people fall. Look at verse 21. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby my brother stumbles, or is offended, or is made weak. Paul the Apostle said, as you consider other people, you consider their destiny. You consider their future. You consider their faithfulness to God. That even if it were meat that will make your brother to fall, any little idea, any little action, any little lie, any little deception that will make your brother careless, that will make your brother look away from holiness and make him fall into sin, it says, it should be good you don't get involved in that. Revelation. Reading from chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. Reading from verse 14. Revelation chapter 2. We're reading from verse 14. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put or to cast the stumbling blocks, stumbling block before the children of Israel, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. Can you imagine Balaam? Balaam said unto the messengers of Balak, You know, I'm a man of God. And even if Balak will give me up of his house, I will not because of that go away from the word of God. I will stand firm. I will stand uncompromising. I will stand steadfast on the word of God. So go, go and tell your master that whatever he is promising me, that will not change me. I am a steadfast and uncompromising man. And eventually he went 
was the servants when he came the second time. And he go to Balak. And Balak said, why didn't you come at the first time? Don't you know I can promote you? Don't you know I command all the resources of our nation and I can give you any amount? And he said, do I have any power now? Whatever the Lord puts in my mouth, that's what I will say. That's what he said. I will still be uncompromising. I will teach the word of God without fear, without favor. That's what he said. But now, he wanted to curse the children of Israel. But the Lord changed the word and changed the curse into a blessing. And then, Balak said, okay, go back home. You have lost a good fortune. You have lost wealth. I would have promoted you. I would have given you this and that, but since you want to remain a poor man, good luck to you, you can go. He said, no, don't talk like that. I know what can bring down those children of Israel. If you introduce your women to them, that's causing Balak, who did not know how to make Israel to fall, making him now to know how to make Israel to fall. And eventually Balak did that. And those people were invited to their idol worship. And they went to worship idol. And, they dist and that destroyed many of the children of Israel. And now in the New Testament, in this particular church in Pagamos, there were, there were people there too that held the practice of Balaam that will teach the people of God how to eat things sacrificed to idols, how to commit fornication, so that, you know, they said, the son of grace. And once you are saved, you are forever saved. And whatever you do does not really matter. That's what they taught them. And Jesus said, look at that verse 14 again. But I have a few things against you. Because... Thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast his stumbling block before the children of Israel, and to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit fornication. Are there people in a church like this, teaching holiness, and teaching purity of heart and life, and teaching a straightforward Christian life, and yet there are people that behind, they'll teach other people, either they teach them by action, or they say they shouldn't do that. They read too much Bible to you, and too much Bible is making you to be not like the world. But well, I've been in the church for more than 20 years, 30 years. I do it, I do it, and they make other people to stumble. Jesus said, it was better a millstone were hanged on the neck of such a person and he should be drowned. I pray you will not be like that. If you are like that and you don't repent, you will perish. If you are like that and you don't repent, hellfire will be your place of abode forever and ever. I pray you will not be angry at the word of God. You will accept the word of God. You will value the words of the Lord Jesus Christ and you will not continue to lead people astray in Jesus' name. You know, we don't know the last message you will hear. You don't know the last chance you will have. And if you are saying, I know what you are talking about, but I'll keep on doing it, but I'll repent, I'll repent. Your time is not in your hand. And the time to repent is not in your hand. If you are not ready while God is talking to you, when well, you want to talk to God, he may say he's not ready. Because you have rejected him, he has also rejected you. If there's any time to repent, it's now. If there's any time to repent, it is at the time when God is speaking to you. You will not waste your opportunity. Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 6. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. 
the Galatians had received the word of the Lord and they had been converted, born again, and they had been following the Lord. They loved the Lord, they loved the word of God, and they loved the preacher of the word of God. In fact, Paul the Apostle said, I guarantee you, and I can be a witness of you, that if it were possible, you would have plucked out your own eye to give unto me. Where now is the blessedness he spoke of? What is the commitment you spoke of before? But you know, some people had gone to them to remove them from the way of the grace and the righteousness of Christ unto another gospel. Look at verse 7, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have received, than that which were preached unto you, let him be accursed. As was said before, so say I now, again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, than that ye have received, everybody tell me, let him be accursed. You'll not uh, listen to people that will make you offend the Lord in Jesus' name. You will not respect anybody to the point you throw your destiny away because of them. Heaven will be number one in your life. The glory of God will be number one in your life. That's why he now tells us in Mark chapter 9, verse 43. Mark chapter 9, verse 43, point number 2. Our definite separation from tempting objects. Our definite separation from tempting objects. We're looking at Mark chapter 9, and we're reading from verse 43. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Look at what Jesus said. He's not talking about your literal hand because at the time of Jesus, all those who listen to him we didn't find anybody cutting off their hand. Peter, James, John. Temptation came to everybody. But he cut off their hand. It's not talking about your hand. It's talking about somebody as useful as your hand. It's talking about somebody as skillful as your hand. It's talking about somebody as profitable to you as your hand. It's profitable in earthly things. Is profitable for earthly profit. Is profitable for earthly progress. But he wants you to compromise. And he has an oppressive nature that he will push you. If you don't, he'll say, come on here. Don't you know he's talking to you? Don't you know my authority? Don't know, you know the power I have? I told you to rebel. I told you to disobey. I told you to disregard the word of God. I told you to forget all their preaching and listen to me and do evil. And you didn't do it. Don't you know my power? Somebody who is so powerful and skillful and useful as your hand. Look at that verse again. Now you understand. If thy hand offend thee, if somebody as good as your hand, as profitable as your hand, as skillful as your hand, as always present permanent as your hand, will make you to offend, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Look at verse 45. In verse 45, if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It's not talking about your foot, your literal foot, 
Because at the time of Jesus, as I explained on the hand, we didn't see anybody cutting off their feet, any of their feet. We didn't see anybody um, kind of maiming themselves so that they can get to heaven. He's talking about the people who make you make progress. They are on the move and they carry you along. Maybe with money. Maybe with encouragement. And they are the people that move you forward in every way. And they move your strategy. And they move your vision. And they move your dream forward. Maybe your dreams like Joseph. The dream of your childhood. And the dream of your early years. And this person will help you to move forward in fulfilling that dream. The only condition is it will make you compromise. It will put pressure on you to compromise. It will make you not to stand on that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. It will be angry at you and it will teach you how to get angry. It will do things that will hinder you from getting to heaven. A person like that that helps you, aids you, in motion, in progress, if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life. That is your childhood dreams you cannot fulfill because the person to move you on is not able to help you, is not willing to help you, except your compromise. Forget dream, forget ambition. Forget progress. Getting to heaven is the number one in your life. What shall you profit a man? If he gains the whole world and he loses his own soul, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? That's why it says, if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter all into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. I pray God will help you. Okay, God will help me. You know, sometimes maybe you are a widow and uh, you, are not, you have not remarried. And there is a man that says, you know, that's why we're here. And you know, yesterday we learned about love and about giving. And if we have this, what's good? And we see our sister, a widow woman in need. And then we fold our hands. How dwells the love of God in us? And so that's why I'm giving you this and I'm giving you that. Well, so far so good. But now he begins to demand that you will commit sin with him. And if you say, no, how can I do that? I'm a child of God. That I'm a widow doesn't mean that I'm not a child of God. Uh -huh, uh -huh. You are quoting Bible now. I'm quoting Bible to me. I'll see where the next uh, house rent will come. I'll see where all those things I'll be giving you. I will withdraw everything. It is better to die of hunger and to die in nakedness, and to die with anybody's help, and go to heaven, than have all the food that will fill this auditorium only for yourself, and then to go to hellfire. Food will not take you to hellfire. Clothes will not take you to hellfire. I will educate your child, I will do this for your children. And then they begin to demand bad things, evil things. All that will not take you to hell in Jesus' name. That's what he's talking about, that you separate, you determine, and you decide, my help will come from God. And if may be delayed a little, but I have faith in God, you will not die of hunger. I will not die of hunger. If your foot shall offend you, cut it off. Cut it off. Cut it off. I did hear you. Cut it off. You see, there are people they sympathize with messengers of Satan who have come to draw them and drag them to hell. And they say, you know, my brother, this thing we're doing together, even though nobody knows, it's not good. 
What if you die in this condition? Ah, I will not die. Let us continue. Okay, what if I die in this condition? Ah, ah, you will not die. Don't say bad things about yourself. Children of God have the promise of life. Ah, ah, children of God. Those who are living in sin, living in adultery and fornication, don't tell me you are children of God. Don't tell me that you have the promise of God to live a long life while you are living in sin and while you are living in rebellion and disobedience. The way forward is to cut off that sin partner. You'll cut them off. I said you'll cut them off. You start by removing them from your handset, from your phone. So I don't even have the number now to call them. And if they call, you cannot recognize the number. If you recognize the number, you block it. Cut it off. That's what Jesus said. So that nobody here on earth will destroy the grace of God that was made available for you from Calvary in Jesus' name. Look at verse 47. Even I offend thee. Look at Jesus. Jesus is making everything complete. Your hand, your foot, your eye. Somebody that always shows you the way. I'm ignorant. I don't know the way. So and so is my eye. And I don't see many things. This is a new world. And this is a modern world. In the new world now, if you don't know this and know that, you will not see your way through. And this is your eye. It's the one that will always say, have you known? Have you heard? This is happening. That is happening. And it will give you relevant information and relevant revelation and relevant illumination. It's your eye. If you are walking in, for you not to stumble, for you not to go into the pit, that's your eye. And if you want to go to any business, you want to go to any enterprise, so that you'll not make a mistake, this is your eye. But with the illumination, with the exposition and with the help and showing you the way, he also comes to make you fall. He also comes to make you sin. He also may, comes to make you tell lies or to deceive other people and to lose your soul. Now, if such a person, as precious as your eye, as delicate as as your eye, as visionary, as your eye, offend you, will make you to offend, block it out. It may be difficult, but if you want to get to heaven, separate from them. You will. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire where their worm dies not and the fire is not quenched do you know that jesus said that over and over let's come to matthew chapter 5 matthew chapter 5 if it were not very important he will not be repeating it and saying it over and over and if you have heard it before, but you know there is somebody who is so close to you, precious to you, profitable to you, and you always think of, you know, I can't make it in life if uh, she is not by my side. I can't make it in life if she is not uh, helping me or he is not helping me. And because of that, you are wedded to sin. You are married to sin. You are married to evil. You are yoked with evil. I pray you will not die in that condition. Amen. Give me a good amen. amen. I'm reading from Matthew chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 29. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members shall perish and not that thy whole body shall be cast into hell. It says it's your eye and it makes it offend. And then you say, what am I going to do now? If I cast him off, he might perish. 
Okay, is it better for the two of you to perish together? Would you go to hell for anybody? Will you perish for anyone? You know, you, you say, I can't continue like this. I can't continue with you. You're good. You're like my eye. You're precious to me. And, but you always lead me astray. And you make me to take a path that will make me perish. I cannot continue like this. I cut you off. And then he says, have mercy on me. If you cut me off, I will perish. If I don't cut you off, I will perish too. You will not perish. You will not allow their tears. You will not allow their excuses to continue in sin and to continue messing up your life. And then you say, I don't know what to do. The Lord has told you what to do. Pluck it out. Verse 29. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that uh, thou, that for thee that one of thy members shall perish, and not that thy whole body shall be cast into hell for starting. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members shall perish, and not that thy whole body shall be cast into hell. I pray God will give us understanding. I will give us obedient ears in Jesus' name. Now, my brothers and sisters, nobody knows your temptation like you yourself. Nobody knows your predicament like you yourself. What does that mean? You know, sometimes uh, it happens in a family, husband and wife. And the man might see that, you know, there's somebody in the family, not a member of the family, somebody outside the family, but coming to the family. And he's a family friend. And the man might know that this family friend is causing me to backslide, causing me to do evil. But it's not bold enough to tell the wife that this is a stumbling block to me. And so he wants to do it personally and privately. I will not have this person in my life anymore. And then methodically, but definitely and clearly, he cuts off that person. And then the wife uh, will notice for a week and say, ah, my husband, for one week now we have not heard from so and so. What's happening? And he says, well, don't worry about that. Um, you know, he has a lot of things to do and we have a lot of things to do too. And the wife will run after that person and bring that person back and say, uh, it's our friend, a family friend, and you don't have any right to cut him off like that, you will drag your husband to hell. If your husband has a reason why he's cutting, he's cutting off that eye, cutting off that hand, cutting off that foot, let it be, leave it like that, so that your husband will go to heaven straightway. Your husband will not go to hell. Sometimes it's the wife that realizes that this person is a stumbling block to me. And I cannot tell my husband how my heart has gone astray and my life is going astray because of this person. And that a woman now wants to get to heaven and has repented, has cried before the Lord, has shed tears and said, Lord, you have told me today, you are speaking to me today, that person will go out of my life. And then after one week or two weeks, the man, the husband realizes, ah, my wife, what's happening? I've not heard of so and so uh, for some time now. Well, let it be. You know, the, the time is like that. Yeah, there are people we knew when we were in the primary school. We don't know them anymore. There are people we are familiar with, conversant with in the secondary school. We don't know them anymore now. Leave that alone. And the husband will say, no, 
I'm going to dig into this. And when you run after that person and bring that person back to the wife, you are friends. I want to see you together. I don't ever want to see you separated. You want to drag your wife to hell, you will go to hell with her. Leave that alone. Let us obey the word of God. Let it be a personal decision. If something you know, is going to drag somebody to hell, let that person take a decision. This will not drag me to hell. I will get to heaven. Anybody get into heaven there? I said anybody get into heaven there? You'll get to heaven in Jesus' name. Objects of sin, objects of temptation, objects of compromise, objects of falling, objects that will hinder you, objects that will not allow you to have real commitment to the truth and real commitment to holiness, objects that will lead you astray, objects that will make you fall into error or falsehood or sin or deception or into compromise, you will cut them off in Jesus' name. And when you do, you do it with determination. And you do it with firmness that this will not pull me to hell. You will not get to hell. Okay, let me say it for myself. I will not go to hell. Matthew chapter 18. I'm reading from verse 8. Matthew chapter 18. We're looking at it from verse 8. Wherefore? If thy, if thy hand or foot offend thee. Look at how many times Christ is emphasizing that now. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. You will not go there. And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out. For thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Anybody going to hell fire them? I said anybody going to hell fire them? You will not go to hell fire. You will separate from them. If it is food, they are using to tie you down, you will throw their food away. If it is money, they are using to hook you, you will throw their money away. You will not be a beggar. If you can pray, God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. God will give you more than anybody is able to give you. God will supply every need of your life in Jesus' name. Whatever progress you cannot make without a same partner, let that progress alone, leave it alone, and let God himself promote you. God will promote you. God will promote me. God will provide for me. God will take care of me. First John chapter 5, First John chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 18. First John chapter 5. We're reading from verse 18. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. That wicked one will not touch you. You will not be in a place, you will not sit in a place that wicked people will cover you up and imprison you in their evil in Jesus' name. Heaven, that's your home. Heaven, that's your destiny. We're coming now to point number three. They are decreed suffering in eternal torments. Those deceivers, those people that draw others to sin, 
those who entice others to sin, and those who are objects of temptation, and they deceive other people to remain in sin, if they don't repent, look at their decreed suffering with eternal torments. I'm reading now from Mark chapter 9, and I'm reading from verse 44. Mark chapter 9, verse 44. Where their worm dies not, and the fire is not quenched. When they enter into hellfire, it will be forever and forever and ever. Verse 46. Where their worm dies not, and the fire is not quenched. And look at verse 48. Where their worm dies not, and the fire is not quenched. Look at verse 49. For every, for every one shall be salted with fire. And every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. What does that mean? In those days, whenever they wanted to preserve any meat, raw meat, they'll put salt on it because they didn't have refrigeration at that time. And that salt will be like a preservative. And the Lord is saying, those who die in sin, those who remain in sin, those who are so sentimental, and they are petting their sin partner at the back, they are saying, yes, I know the negative effect of your action on my life. I know the negative compromising effect of your lifestyle on my life. But you know, I love you so much and we're together forever. It says those people, the fire will be like salt. It will preserve them. And when they go to hell fire, they will never die. Their worm will be suffering forever and ever. I will not be like that. You will not be in Jesus' name. Look at Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. I'm reading here from verse 40. Matthew chapter 13. And we're reading from verse 14. It says in verse 40, As therefore the tares are gathered and burnt in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world the son of man shall send forth his angels and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend all things that offend the people who station themselves in the household of faith and their teaching on belief. The people who stay and station themselves in the household of saints and their teaching on godliness. The people who permanent themselves in the household of holy people and their teaching on holiness. It says they shall gather out of his kingdom all things not offend and them which do iniquity the people that do iniquity by themselves they don't lead others to iniquity only by themselves they do iniquity and they don't repent they'll go to the same hell and the people who say they have repented and they station themselves in the household of faith and they're teaching other people to offend and to mess up their lives they too will perish verse 42 and shall cast them into a furnace of fire and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Remember once again, those are the words of Jesus Christ. The words of Jesus Christ. Let's look at verse 49, chapter 13, verse 49. So shall it be at the end of the world, the angel shall come forth and save us, separate the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into a furnace of into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing 
and gnashing of teeth. Hell is not a laughing matter. Hell is not a joking matter. When people get there, it's forever and ever, and they suffer and they wail and they weep forever and ever. Whatever it will take, you will not get to hell. You might have to cut off that right hand. You might have to cut off that uh, right foot. You might have to pluck out that right eye. Whatever it will take, you will repent. You remain in righteousness and you remain truthful and faithful to the Lord, uncompromising for the rest of your life in Jesus' name. Uh, let's look at Matthew chapter 25 and we're reading from verse 41. Matthew chapter 40, 25, verse 41. In verse 41, then shall you say to them on the left hand, I will be on the right hand. I said, I will be on the right hand. But those who live anyhow, careless, oppressive, deceitful, and deceiving other people to go into sin and to pick up the dirty things there to mess up themselves, all the things they're forsaking. And they use their authority and their position and their power to make people go back into sin. It says, Then shall you say unto them, On the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. That place is not prepared for me and I will not go there. I will not sit on Satan's seat. I will not go to Satan's place. My place is in heaven. I said my place is in heaven. I will not join the devil. I will not sympathize with the devil in Jesus' name. Look at Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. And I'm reading from verse 10. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation and shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up tell me the smoke of their torment ascendeth up how long? forever and ever and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image, whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. The people who are doing Satan's work for him in the house of God, in the world that God has created, the people who are more faithful to Satan than they are to God, the people who use objects from Satan to make the saints of God fall, they're doing Satan's work. They'll be with Satan. They will live with Satan forever and ever. I will do the work of God. I will live with God forever and ever. You will live in heaven forever in Jesus' name. Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, verse 20. And the beast was taken, and was seen the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that received the mark of the beast. See, there are some people, they show some things that look like miracles. 
that look like signs and wonders to deceive people. And they try to say, I'm telling you, you can do this, you can do this. And then if you say, but that is sin, how can I do that? They say, okay, wait. Then they show you something that looks like a miracle. And they say, okay, if God is not with me, how can this happen? Well, we know the Bible enough. The magicians of Pharaoh threw their rods down and those rods became, can you tell me, serpents. The same thing that Aaron did, they also did. That doesn't mean that God is with them. Miracles without holiness is still of the devil. I will not receive miracles from the devil. It says, with that miracle, he deceived them that received the mark of the beast. And them that worship that is image. He says, these both shall cast or cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. That's where you will not be. Look at chapter 20 and verse 10. Revelation chapter 20, reading from verse 10. It says in verse 10, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night for how long? forever and ever. I pray you will not be there. Satan will be there. False prophets will be there. The beast, beastly people who are beastly nature, they'll be there. And then look at the rest of the people that will be there. I hope your name is not here. I said your name is not there. Look at chapter 21, Revelation verse 8. But the fearful, unbelieving, the abominable, and murderers, and, so, and all mongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars. How many liars? Tell me, tell me. All liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Look at it from that verse 8. The fearful, yes I know what to do. I shall cut off that woman. I shall cut off that man. It's always leading me to sin. And when I prayed and prayed and prayed in the church and I said I will not do this anymore. That man will come along and that woman will come along smiling and saying, I've been looking for you. Come on. Don't tell me that you're not going to continue. And then I'm so fearful. I cannot tell him. I cannot tell her. I'm not of that habit anymore. The fearful, the unbelieving. I don't believe. I don't believe that God will do that. The unbelieving, the abominable. Those who do abominable things because they have highly placed people who lure them into that abominable sin. Do see the abominable things because they are people of position and people of power and people of authority leading them to do that thing. They cannot say no. And the murderers, those who kill other people, they assassinate their character. They assassinate and they kill them, not with cutlass, not with gun, but they use other means to kill and to destroy. They kill their vision. They kill their life. They kill their power. And they kill their desire to move forward. All those murderers and the all mongers. All mongers means idolatry, um, adulterers, and then the sorcerers and the idolaters and all liars and all those pretenders they'll have their part in the lake that which burns with fire and brimstone which is the second death thank God you will not be there but you know you must repent and you must make up your mind that any of those things that will pull you there God forbid for you to get to hell you know if you get to hell you will not get there, but if you did, Satan will laugh. Ha, ha, ha. 
you went to Bible study and that your preacher knocked me and knocked me and called me Satan, called me devil, called me the old serpent and said that, you know, I am going to hell. Uh -huh. Even those of you that he preached to and he was knocking me and knocking me, now you are here with me and Satan will torture and torment those people. Even in that hell forever and ever, I will not get there. Uh, look up at me here. Look up at me here. I pray I will not get to hell. Say, Pastor, you will not get to hell. But just for illustration, if I slipped, if I compromised, if I, because somebody there is trying to do this and that, I get angry, I knock him, I throw something at him. And I say, I'm a preacher, I will not take nonsense in this church. And then I get angry and I say things I shouldn't say. And, you know, in a fit of anger, somebody can just collapse there while he's angry. And he dies without a chance to repent. Just for illustration, if I got to hell, Satan will say, uh-uh, holiness preacher, welcome. We will make you see something. You preach and preach, you knock me, you call me names, and you said you're deeper, 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 higher and broader. I will show you something. I know that he's a wicked devil, and if I got there, he will want to do something. He will show me more than pepper. But I will not get there. I said I will not get there. And you will not get there. You and I. I said you and I. I said you and I. Where are we going? We are going to in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. So that where I am, there you will be also. You will be there. I said you'll be there. Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. I'm reading from verse 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Whosoever, whosoever, preacher, pastor, worker, minister, overseer, member, deeper, higher, holier, whosoever, whosoever, anybody at the Bible study, anybody in our church, any careless one, any compromising one, anyone that is toying with sin, gambling with sin in the secret, and whosoever was not found, reaching in the book of life, was cast into the lake of fire. Where are you going to spend eternity? I said, where will you spend eternity? Tell the Lord, where will you spend eternity? Rise up and tell the Lord, rise up and tell the Lord, heaven is a holy place, nothing impure, nothing sinful, nothing deceptive, nothing adulterous, nothing that is having sorcery, nothing that is not sincere and open will get into heaven. It's a holy place and the people who are going to be there will be the people who are prepared and the people who are washing the blood of the Lamb and the word of God abides in them and they are walking in the way of righteousness and they cut off and they cut off and they cut off anyone that will lead them into sin get ready prepare for heaven hell is a is an eternal place pray that you'll not be there you must be born again